Welcome in on a Friday. I'm Juliet Goodrich. It's back to Washington soon for Vice President Kamala Harris after her big moment at the DNC. Plus, is a presidential candidate about to drop out of the race? We're live in Arizona, where RFK Jr. will address the future of his campaign. This is CBS News 24-7. We start by taking our live feeds to Las Vegas, where the trial continues of a former politician. Robert Tellis is the former Clark County administrator. He's accused of killing Las Vegas Review oh, Journal yeah. reporter Jeff Gehrman, you who wrote cannot, critical uh, articles really about Tellis. And staying in that same city, former President Donald Trump will be talking taxes during a campaign stop. Trump will then head over to Arizona for a rally tonight. But first, Secret Service agents, several of them have now been placed on leave. This after last month's assassination attempt against Trump in Pennsylvania. The Justice Department takes seriously its responsibility to protect Americans from illegal conduct that undermines competition and drives up prices. We will continue, continue to aggressively enforce the antitrust laws and protect the American people from those who would violate them. Okay, for context there, this was the Justice Department. They had just filed an antitrust lawsuit against software real estate company um, RealPage. And so that was what Attorney General Merrick Garland had to say about that. So we're going to continue to follow the latest on the Secret Service. Also, following our live feeds with the lawsuit and the trial happening in Las Vegas. But first, we're going to take more from our live feeds. This is 24 7. We'll be right back. Welcome back to CBS News 24-7. A live picture now at West Sacramento there. Looks like a nice day, but Zoe Mintz is going to fill us in. I'm hearing that possibly some record lows. Well, record cold high temperatures. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but overall today, afternoon high temperatures could be some of the coldest that parts of the West Coast have ever seen for today for late August. This kind of a chill is not normal by any means. So let's pull up our numbers all across the country because again, it is the West Coast of the United States that we're focusing on and those temperatures this afternoon are going to be chilly. Normally places like Reno, Nevada, See temperatures this time of year in the 90s, triple digits. Today, a high temperature of 68 degrees. Their old record low high temperature for Reno is 71. So they'll be breaking that by about three degrees. The fact that they are seeing a high temperature in August in the upper 60s, very abnormal for this time of year. Also Seattle upper 50s, Medford going to be near the mid 60s and even places like Sacramento like we just showed you. It looks beautiful out there and it is because highs are only going to be in the mid 70s. That is such a nice change of pace compared to all of the activity that they have seen. Unfortunately, though, as a storm system arrives, it is going to bring red flag warnings all across places like Nevada and across the desert southwest because we are looking at a storm system arriving. So if we do take a closer look at that storm system that is going to be making its way across the country, it's coming in from the Pacific Northwest. Oh, and it will continue to impact places across the central United States as well and across the north as well. Biggest issue, though, as we step out over the next 24 to 48 hours is going to be this area of low pressure and that is going to bring temperatures about 30 degrees below average and the potential for snow in the Sierra above 8,000 feet. It is not going to stick. It's not going to accumulate. But the fact that we might see some snow flurries in August is pretty crazy. I'm also happy that we're not going to deal with any of the crazy heat across the West Coast because that cold storm system, it has officially arrived. Sending things back over to you, Juliet. Wow, snow flurries in August. That's amazing. All right, Zoe, thank you so much. Our live feeds are inside a Las Vegas courtroom where the trial will continue for a former politician on trial for murder. Robert Tellis is accused of killing investigative journalist Jeff Gehrman back in 2022. The attack came after the journalist wrote critical articles about Tellis. Now, Tellis claims he was framed and the evidence planted. All right, jumping the map to Tennessee, shall we, where a former Memphis police officer charged in the death of Tyree Nichols is expected to change his not guilty plea in federal court today. Emmett Martin is one of four former officers accused of using excessive force in the beating that killed Nichols last year. 
Also an update on the search for victims in the super yacht that sunk off the coast of Sicily. Dive teams have recovered the body of the final missing person. The body has not been identified, but is believed to be the daughter of British tech tycoon Mike Lynch. The vessel with 22 people on board rapidly sank after it was hit by a tornado earlier this week. To Canada now, freight train workers are back at work after being locked out over a labor dispute. Some trains resumed operations today, but that could soon come to a halt. The union issued a 72-hour strike, and that notice to one of Canada's two major railroads today. So the move comes just a day after the Canadian government stepped in and ordered the rail companies and rail workers into arbitration. The strike could be a major blow to the U.S. economy. All right, let's now head to Russia. Ukrainian forces stepping up their attacks, launching new strikes. We have new video right now. It is showing a huge tower of flames and black smoke shooting up from a Russian oil depot right now after it was hit by a drone. Meantime, India's prime minister in Kiev today for talks with President Vladimir Zelensky. CBS News correspondent Ian Lee is on the ground in Ukraine with the very latest for us. Ukraine is keeping up with the drone attacks deep inside Russia. The latest hit an air base in the country's southern Volgograd region. Plumes of black smoke and explosions could be seen coming from it. And the governor of the region didn't say what facility had been hit, but that there were no casualties. Drones have completely changed the nature of warfare. Both sides are looking for an advantage. We met with one drone unit from the 117 Territorial Defense Brigade. They showed us how they arm and operate a drone that costs roughly $400. And what's remarkable is how that simple weapon can take out a multi-million dollar piece of armor. Their mission now is to support operations in the Kursk region, and they play a critical role. When we spoke to a commander who's been fighting on the ground, he couldn't speak highly enough about how drones are helping him push forward by taking out targets while also protecting his men. Counter-drone warfare has also changed, and that's been a struggle for both sides. What I found interesting is no matter who has the upper hand, Ukraine or Russia, China is the big winner. Both Kiev and Moscow not only get their drones from there, but also source the means to counter and jam them. The fear that China could someday cut Ukraine off has fueled efforts by Kiev to develop and mass produce their own cheap drones. Ian Lee, thank you. Okay, meanwhile, a U.S. official confirms the Biden administration is expected to announce a $125 million package for Ukraine as soon as today. That package is expected to include ammo, counter drone systems, and weapons. All right, coming up on CBS News 24 7, we're going to go live to Weijia Jiang. She's in Chicago for a wrap up of the Democratic National Convention. We'll be right back. Welcome back to CBS News 24-7. We now turn our attention back to Las Vegas, where former President Donald Trump will be making a stop on the campaign trail. And that is where we find CBS News campaign reporter Olivia Rinaldi. And Olivia, thank you for joining us. I understand that Trump will be talking taxes today. Yeah, Julia, this is a key part of Trump's economic policies if he were to be reelected. It's his no tax on tips policy. He announced this a few months ago when he was last in Las Vegas. And he talks fondly about how he came up with it. Basically, he says he was talking to a waitress at a hotel here, and she said, you know, something that really crushes them as service workers here is the taxes that they get on their tips. That it takes a lot of what they earn. And so Trump decided, well, how about no tax on tips? That's where the origin of that policy came in. It's kind of taken on a life of its own. We now know Vice President Kamala Harris is endorsing a no tax on tips policy as well. However, she's coupling that with a raise on the federal minimum wage. So that's interesting to note there. But this is is kind of rounding out this week where Trump has been on the campaign trail, visiting several battleground states, providing some counter programming to what's going on at the Democratic National Convention. So, this is his last day of that counter programming battleground state tour, where he'll be here later today in Las Vegas talking about his no tax on tips policy and, uh, you know, other economic policies as well. Yeah, and Olivia, now after Vegas, the former president will be heading to Glendale, Arizona for a rally tonight. We're also hearing RFK Jr. will be making announcements shortly in Arizona on the fact uh, that he'll be dropping out of his campaign. What are you hearing about a possible Trump endorsement? Well, it's something we're following very closely. Will he endorse him? Won't he endorse him? You know, there's still a lot of speculation about that. Last night, uh, the Trump campaign 
teased a special guest speaker at this event tonight. Trump also has been kind of dodgy on questions about whether or not he will receive that endorsement from RFK Jr. and what that would look like if he joins him on stage. So they're not giving us any indication yet. The Trump campaign keeps telling me, you know, you have to go back to the Kennedy campaign and ask them what's going to happen, that the ball is really in their court if he's going to drop out of the race. But the notable thing about all of this is that RFK is planning to drop out, that he is uh, likely going to, he, last night he pulled his name off of the Arizona ballot. That's mm -hmm. a key battleground state, so he's not going to appear on that ballot, but is he still going to be on other ballots in other battleground states, Nevada, Michigan, North Carolina, places where he had made the ballot, is he still going to appear on there if he were to drop out today? This would have huge implications for the race as a whole, whether or not uh, that would impact taking voters away from Vice President Kamala Harris, whether it will take them away from former President Donald Trump. So a lot of developments in this race and an endorsement of Trump would shake it up just even further, Juliet. Yeah, absolutely. We're all live feeds. We'll be tracking his movements today. Olivia Rinaldi, thank you so much for your live report and your insight. So Vice President Kamala Harris will take a break from the campaign trail for now after her big night on the final day of the DNC. CBS News Senior White House Correspondent Weijia Jang joining us live from Chicago now. Weijia, thanks for joining us. As we were just talking about RFK Jr., let's talk about what that means for the presidential race. Well, the vice president's campaign is essentially saying, be our guest, go ahead, endorse uh, Donald Trump because... We're good. Uh, they issued a statement to say that he was always the spoiler for Donald Trump, that he was never really launching a serious campaign, and that they say if you look at the polls, uh, he is in, quote, free fall, pointing to the fact that at one point he had 15 percent of support, but now it's about 5 percent. And of those people who are supporting RFK Jr., uh, they are split between Harris and Trump. And so they don't think that it's actually going to make any difference when it comes to um, moving the needle to actually get uh, votes that matter, to actually change the electoral map. And they also say, Juliet, that, you know, RFK Jr. comes with a lot of baggage, pointing to his uh, stance on vaccines, pointing to his conspiracy theories about 9-11, and, of course, the bear incident <laughs> from yes. about a de decade ago. So, yeah, the Harris campaign says they are okay <laughs> with uh, if that were to happen. Ouija, let's talk about the day after, the big night before, big moment for BP, BP Harris to reintroduce herself to the country as a whole, as a presidential candidate. So how is the campaign feeling uh, this morning? Well, everyone I've spoken to, uh, in, whether it's campaign officials or DNC, uh, aides say that this was a home run. They really think that the entire convention knocked it out of the park because these conventions are really meant to energize the base and to unite the party. And they point to the fact that every single night you could feel the energy in the room. You could see, uh, you know, people of all ages, people of all races, uh, and they believe it really reflects America which is also what the vice president is trying to stress with her campaign and her platform, that she wants to fight for all Americans, something that was part of her message last night. So I will say, Juliet, being in the room, you know, the first three nights really focused on this idea of joy, of turning the page, um, you know, to leave all the darkness and the division behind. Mm -hmm. And that word kept popping up. Uh, the vice president actually... I think turned a little bit and, and was more serious. And she focused on a lot of different issues, the top issues in the election. And she wanted to come across as presidential to show that she's ready for the job on day one. And so that paired with her personal stories is another reason why the campaign feels like she was able to accomplish what she wanted to reintroduce herself to the country. Yes, up next will be rallies and then the debates. All right, Weijia Jang, live in Chicago. Weijia, thank you. Let's talk about the Secret Service again. Secret Service agents, several of them, have been placed on leave after last month's assassination attempt against former President Trump, that happening in Pennsylvania. So CBS News Homeland Security and Justice reporter Nicole Saganga joining us live now. So, Nicole, thanks for joining us. What are you hearing about the Secret Service? 
Julia, good to be with you. At least five U.S. Secret Service officials have been placed on this administrative leave, including the Pittsburgh special agent in charge who was with the former president on the night of July 13th, uh, whose office was responsible for coordinating that security plan with local law enforcement leading up to that rally. In addition to that, three other officials within Secret Service's Pittsburgh field office and one agent within Donald Trump's detail. Now, this is the next shoot a drop for Secret Service personnel following that resignation of uh, the former director Kim Cheadle last month, but it is unclear if all of these actions are disciplinary. Agents are routinely placed on leave during the course of investigations for a series of reasons, including mental health relief. Now, what does administrative leave actually mean? It means these agents and officials have been pulled from their day to day duties, but they still collect paychecks. They still report to the office. And importantly, Juliet, they still hold on to their security clearances. Members of relevant and congressional committees have been notified of the actions. That is important. What with so many lawmakers hankering for some kind of action to be taken as a result of the colossal failure on the part of Secret Service and law enforcement in Butler, Pennsylvania on that Saturday in July. Nicole, before you go, I want to touch on something else. The Justice Department has just filed an antitrust lawsuit um, against software real estate company RealPage. So here is what Attorney General uh, Mayor Garland had to say. Let's listen in. The Justice Department takes seriously its responsibility to protect Americans from illegal conduct that undermines competition and drives up prices. We will continue, continue to aggressively enforce the antitrust laws and protect the American people from those who would violate them. All right, Nicole, so break that down for us. The lawsuit for uh, the U.S. What are the allegations made by the DOJ? This is another big antitrust lawsuit for the Biden administration's Justice Dep Department. This one, of course, against RealPage, a property management software provider. And this complaint alleging collusion among landlords nationwide to inflate rents for millions of Americans. The complaint claims RealPage, which is a Texas-based company, engaged in price fixing, sharing non-public confidential information of rents nationwide, then using its own algorithm algorithmic pricing software to generate pricing recommendations. It's a modern day take on an old law, the complaint alleging that RealPage violated sections one and two of the Sherman Act. The DOJ also accusing the company of replacing competition with rent coordination, allowing landlords to maximize rent costs and ultimately hurt American renters nationwide. Now the DOJ is, is joined uh, by the Attorney General of California, Colorado, Connecticut, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oregon, Tennessee, and Washington. So really, truly coast to coast implications here, Juliet. All right, Nicole Saganga. Nicole, thank you. Well, talks for a ceasefire deal are set for another round, but hope is growing dim as both Israel and Hamas blame each other for trying to derail progress on an agreement. BBC's, BBC News correspondent Weary Davies joins us live now from Jerusalem. So tell us, where do things stand right now? Well, hi, Juliet. Well, there hasn't any concrete uh, news coming out of the talks in Cairo, but perhaps that's no bad thing. I think it shows there's a, a degree of seriousness about the level of the talks. We know that in the last uh, couple of days, uh, Joe Biden made a direct phone call to the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, trying to persuade the Israelis to give some ground on the critical issue of which Israeli troops would remain in southern Gaza in the event of a ceasefire. And there are some unconfirmed Israeli reports this evening that perhaps those talks uh, have been a little bit more successful in that area. But on the other hand, we've heard from Hamas officials who've told the BBC that they don't see any progress thus far out of the talks. Uh, there's an incredible amount of pressure, of course, for the talks to succeed because the fighting continues both in Gaza itself, where civilians and soldiers are being killed, and also in southern Lebanon, where Israel has continued to, to strike against Hezbollah targets. But the talks are continuing in, Ky in Cairo. Uh, American officials there, Israeli officials there, Hamas are not directly involved, but they are continuing continuing as much and as far as we can hear. Yes, we understand Israel has ordered thousands of Palestinians to leave as it intensifies its operations in Gaza. So where are evacuees taking shelter? 
Well, this is the thing. At least 90% of the 2 million Gaza inhabitants are basically homeless. They're internal refugees. They've been forced to move perhaps more than once during the course of this 10-month war. Uh, they're being urged by the Israelis when the Israelis strike certain areas in Gaza to move to a designated safe areas. But the reality is there is no such thing as a safe area really in Gaza. Uh, civilians are clearly being caught up in the shelling. Uh, according to the Hamas-run health authority, uh, uh, ministry in Gaza, uh, 40,000 people at least have been killed over the 10 months of the war. And it's clear that when Israel does attack targets such as former schools or schools where they accuse Hamas of basing their operations, civilians are being caught up as well because civilians have been seeking refuge in those schools. Another thing that's come out in the last 24 hours is that because of the humanitarian crisis and the health crisis in Gaza, polio is now a reality in Gaza. The UN has confirmed that a, a young baby has contracted polio, has been partially paralysed and of course polio is a serious and highly infectious disease and the UN is pressing again for a ceasefire uh, so they can get vaccinations in and the, the population can be treated and the fear is that polio may take a hold given the sanita sanitary conditions in Gaza. All right, BBC News correspondent Wyrie Davies, thank you so much. Coming up, our Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will be speaking at an event in Phoenix soon, so our live feeds will be monitoring his arrival. You're streaming CBS News 24-7. CBS News 24-7, the Federal Reserve will soon start cutting interest rates. That's the headline from Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell during a speech in Wyoming today. Take a listen. For much of the past three years, inflation ran well above our 2% goal, and labor market conditions were extremely tight. The FOMC's primary focus has been on bringing down inflation, and appropriately so. Prior to this episode, most Americans alive today had not experienced the pain of high inflation for a sustained period. Inflation brought substantial, substantial hardship, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. High inflation triggered stress and a sense of unfairness that linger today. Our restrictive monetary policy helped restore balance between aggregate supply and demand, easing inflationary pressures and ensuring that inflation expectations remained well anchored. Inflation is now much closer to our objective, with prices having risen 2.5 percent over the past 12 months. After a pause earlier this year, progress toward our 2 percent objective has resumed. My confidence has grown that inflation is on a sustainable path back to 2 percent. All right, the news sending stocks climbing. Here is a look at the numbers on Wall Street as we speak. We're seeing the green. That is a good sign. Joining us now is CBS News contributor Javier David. So, Javier, let's talk about what this news has done now. And obviously, it's helping the stock market. Yeah, look, as we say in financial markets vernacular, this is a very dovish speech um, and one that accounts uh, largely for the sort of rapturous response that we're getting. Um, in the asset market, stocks are rallying, bond yields are in retreat, and as Martha Stewart famously says, it's a good thing. So rare is the occasion that the central bank sort of tells the market exactly what it wants to hear. It actually does not like to uh, respond directly to the markets or try and influence asset prices. But um, that's exactly what uh, Mr. Powell did at Jackson Hole. He really um, tilted the playing field. He, this is an inflection point in the fight against inflation. He acknowledged that the risks are tilted less toward inflation and much more toward weakness in the labor market that may trigger a recession if it results in widespread layoffs. He did say that um, labor markets are not a factor in inflation, so that's a, also a very meaningful development. Um, all told, this was a very powerful speech, and I think it, you know, it accounts again for what we're seeing in the markets. Yeah, he is hinting about the rate cuts. Yeah, so the the you know he, he's he's definitely putting September in play, and even more importantly, he's suggesting that this will be the down payment, perhaps, on a series of much more meaningful, deep, potentially uh, deeper rate cuts that may take place later. And of course, you know, a central banker never wants to acknowledge um, when and how they're going to move, but. Um, it certainly does seem like this is going to be at least the start of a sustained campaign, which is 
uh, something the market definitely wanted to hear. Yeah, absolutely. The markets are responding on this Friday. All right, Javier, David, thank you so much for your insight. Appreciate it. Sure thing. All right, heading over to Las Vegas now, where former President Donald Trump will be talking taxes during a campaign stop. Trump will then head over to Arizona for a rally tonight. So let's bring in our Arizona map now, where a big decision might be coming in the presidential race. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will be speaking at an event in Phoenix in just about a half hour from now. Our feeds are checking in on that. And that is where we find CBS News campaign reporter Allison Novello. She joins us now. Allison, thank Thank you. So what are you hearing now from your sources about Kennedy's announcement any moment? Hi, yes, so I'm here at the event where we are expected to hear his remarks in about 30 minutes. Uh, we knew from our sources that Kennedy would likely be suspending his campaign today and endorsing former President Donald Trump. We also knew that his decision would likely come at the 11th hour, which is exactly what we saw yesterday, right? We learned that Kennedy withdrew his name from the ballot in Arizona after learning he would be on the ballot just Wednesday. And more proof that this decision is coming at the 11th hour. Earlier this week, Kennedy was supposed to have two of his own campaign events in Chicago, which he then canceled to fly to Pennsylvania and New York to defend his ballot access in those states. Today, we got some new reporting that his campaign submitted his petition for ballot access in New Hampshire. So we are getting some mixed signals. But, uh, you know, funding is drying up for the campaign. We know that he is over $3 million in debt at this point. And according to the latest CBS News polls, he's pulling at around 2 percent nationally. So we are still expecting him to suspend his campaign. Uh, and that's what we're hearing today. And what could a Trump endorsement do to Trump's campaign? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in certain states, it, we are expecting the election to come down to just a handful of votes, right? In Pennsylvania, for example, where Kennedy uh, was fighting for ballot access earlier this state, in 2016, we know that Donald Trump won the state by just over 40,000 votes. Uh, and many say that the reason Hillary Clinton lost in 2016 in Pennsylvania was because of third-party candidates siphoning away those votes from her. So, you know, it is important to sort of watch where Kennedy ends up on the ballot because it could be impactful for who wins in November. All right. All eyes on what he may see, say in just a few minutes, and we'll stay on top of that. Thank you so much for the update. Appreciate it. Meanwhile, former President Trump's opponent, Vice President Kamala Harris, will leave for Washington, D.C. soon after her big night at the DNC in Chicago. She accepted her party's nomination for the presidency. And moments ago, Chicago's mayor, Brandon Johnson, thanked the officers and workers who helped keep people safe during the convention. These brave women and men show the world how we can maintain safety while protecting the people's right to protest and to have their voices heard. That is what I asked them to do. And I'm so proud of that work. The DNC was truly a full force of government effort. The months of preparation that went into this it's truly an incredible testament to the spirit of our city. We are the city that works, and we work because of our working people. From the CTA workers, train conductors, and bus truck drivers who made sure folks could get home, to the streets and sanitation workers who made sure we showed the best of who we are to the entire world. And of course, to our Department of Transportation that coordinated all of these routes and closures. To every single city worker, regardless of their department, that contributed in big ways, you did it small and large. You welcomed visitors to Chicago. And that's Chicago's mayor, Brandon Johnson, obviously thanking all of the workers who made this a successful convention security-wise. Um, our reporters were there. We saw it throughout the, the four days there. It seemed like all safe and sound. And that, according to the mayor, there was in thanks to all of the officers and workers who helped keep the convention safe. All right, now taking a live look out to West Sacramento, shall we? Traffic moving right along. We do a traffic check, but let's do a weather check and let's get Zoe Mintz to fill us in. Hi, Zoe. Oh, hello. We are looking at record cold high temperatures across California and a lot of the Pacific Northwest as a very large storm system, a very early season cold system. It has arrived and it's going to bring those temperatures across the West Coast of the United States 
well below average. In fact, about 30 degrees below average temperatures are expected across the west this afternoon with Sacramento seeing only a high of 74 degrees. That is a record cold high temperature for late August. These are well below average 68 in Reno. Their old record low temperature today was 71 degrees. So the fact that they have a forecast high of 68 is pretty crazy and for this time of year, not normal by any means, but they're not just dealing with the chill. They're also dealing with quite a lot of other weather factors. This area below me is a red flag warning because they are looking at very windy conditions and very dry, although not everybody's going to be seeing the dryness. There is a little bit of moisture that's going to be pushing along this system as well. So if we take all of this off and show you that system, there's quite a lot of things on here that might be a little bit confusing, but we are going to continue to see that low pressure system impacting the Pacific Northwest. That Pacific Northwest system is going to continue to impact places across the Northwest for the next 24 to 48 hours. If we do take a closer look at that system and the cold air that it is going to continue to bring, the biggest impact is the fact that the cold air comes all the way from Canada. So that's the reason it's about 30 degrees below average and also the reason that the highest elevations of the Sierra Nevada could potentially see a little bit of snow as we step out overnight tonight and overnight tomorrow. Something we're going to keep our eyes on, but at least they're dealing with cooler temperatures. It's much better than the excessive heat that they saw just a couple of weeks ago. Juliet, back to you. All right, Zoe, thank you. Hundreds of thousands of people are left stranded by floodwaters in Bangladesh and India. At least 15 people have been killed. This is video from Bangladesh. It shows people walking through knee deep water. The military and other authorities have started rescue operations in the region right now. All right, coming up, our live feeds will take you back inside a Las Vegas courtroom where a former politician is on trial for murder. You're watching CBS News 24-7. Our live feeds now taking us inside a Las Vegas courtroom where a former politician on trial for murder is taking the stand in his own defense. Robert Tellis is accused of killing investigative journalist Jeff Gehrman. Back in 2022, the attack came after the journalist wrote critical articles about Tellis. Tellis claims he was framed and the evidence was planted. This just in, a judge in Boston has denied a motion to dismiss two charges, including second-degree murder, against Karen Reed. She is the woman accused of killing her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe. Prosecutors argue that Reed hit O'Keefe with her car and left him to die during a snowstorm back in 2022. Last month, Reed's trial ended in a mistrial due to a hung jury. A new trial is set for January of next year. All right, jumping the map to Tennessee now, where a former Memphis police officer charged in the death of Tyree Nichols is expected to change his not guilty plea in federal court today. Emmett Martin is one of four former officers accused of using excessive force in the beating that killed Nichols last year. We also have an update on the search for victims in the super yacht that sunk off the coast of Sicily. Dive teams have recovered the body of the final missing person. The body has not been identified, but is believed to be the daughter of British tech tycoon Mike Lynch. The vessel with 22 people on board rapidly sank after it was hit by a tornado earlier this week. On to Canada. Freight train workers are back at work after being locked out over a labor dispute. Some trains resumed operations today, but that could soon come to a halt. The union issued a 72-hour strike notice to one of Canada's two major railroads today. The move comes just a day after the Canadian government stepped in and ordered the rail companies and rail workers into arbitration. The strike could be a major blow to the U.S. economy. The Justice Department has just filed an antitrust lawsuit against software real estate company RealPage. So the lawsuit accuses the company of price fixing, and that allowed landlords to then hike up rental prices for millions of Americans. Take a listen. Competing landlords agree to submit to RealPage on a daily basis their most sensitive non-public information, including rental rates, lease terms, and projected vacancies. RealPage then combines this data from competing landlords and feeds it into an algorithm that provides real-time pricing recommendations back to the competing landlords. But as we allege, these are more than just recommendations. 
Rio Page actively polices landlords' compliance with those recommendations. It also monitors landlords' other policies by, for example, trying to stop concessions that landlords use to attract or retain renters. A large number of landlords effectively agree to outsource their pricing decisions to RealPage by using a, quote, auto-accept setting, which effectively permits RealPage to determine the price a renter will pay. Landlords understand what their arrangement with RealPage gets them. As one said, quote, I always like this product because your algorithm uses proprietary data from other subscribers to suggest, suggest rents and terms. That's classic price fixing, close quote. Everybody knows the rent is too damn high, and we allege this is one of the reasons why. RealPage claims the allegations against the company are false and insists that RealPage customers decide their own rent prices and can reject the algorithm's recommendations. All right, let's take you to Iceland and take a look at this. A volcano eruption prompting a state of emergency there. In fact, video showing glowing hot lava just shooting up from the ground. The eruption started last night following a series of earthquakes there and then continued on to this morning. This is the sixth eruption since December. All right, we take you to Hawaii. Let's head there now, where a tropical storm inching closer to the big island. A tropical storm watch is in effect. The storm is expected to bring several inches of rain, gusty winds, and high surf. Let's bring in Zoe Mintz. Boy, from the live pictures there, you wouldn't think something is on its way. No, from the live <laughs> pictures, I wish I was in Hawaii right now, laying on the beach, enjoying the palm trees. Those palm trees not even moving right now, but it is the calm before the true storms arrive. And there's actually three storm systems that we are currently tracking across the central parts of the Pacific Ocean. It is pretty fun to see this active hurricane season and the fact that it's not going to be impacting many places is also a good news. However, Hawaii has actually only ever observed five landfalling hurricanes. So the fact that it's getting this close is definitely out of the ordinary. We're also going to be seeing not just one system, not just two systems, but three systems that we are currently tracking. You could kind of see the outline one, then we got two, then we got a third, all of them in a row, and they're all heading out to the west. They're all heading towards Hawaii. So let's take a closer look at those three systems as they head towards Hawaii. Because again, Hawaii is going to be seeing the biggest impacts. It's not going to be directly impacting the CONUS or the continental United States. So that is good news. But if we do take a closer look at those three systems, we are seeing them pretty far away from each other. But the one that is going to be heading towards Hawaii, that's name is Hone. It was originally going to be Hector, but the second that it passed this line right here, it automatically made its way to the Central Pacific, and they have a different list of hurricane names than the East Pacific does. Fun fact for you all. What is not so much fun is the chance for this tropical storm, that tropical storm Hone, to make its way towards the southern parts of the Hawaiian Islands. It's going to impact the Big Island the most where there are tropical storm warnings in effect. It likely is going to arrive late Saturday and into Sunday, bringing wind gust upwards of 65 to 75 miles an hour and bringing very high storm surge as well as high surf and a lot of rainfall. The Big Island is going to be the biggest losers when it comes to this storm system, picking up upwards of five to seven inches of rain. Things we're all going to keep our eyes on for Hawaii over the next 24 to 48 hours. Juliet, back to you. CBS News is Eye on America keeps our dedication where it belongs in your communities across the country. Democratic leaders addressed the division that defines our politics during the DNC this week. But there's an effort to bridge that divide that's been underway long before this week. CBS News correspondent Jim Axelrod takes us to Columbus, Georgia, showing the power of personal connection to heal and why we may soon need it more than ever. This cocktail party in Columbus, Georgia. When we start to dehumanize each other, that's extremely dangerous. Is actually one man's attempt to bridge our national civic divide. And you all had the courage to say enough. Dave I Say runs One Small Step, an initiative that pairs people from opposite ends of the political spectrum for a one hour conversation. He believes fiercely in the healing properties of contact and connection. The big dream for One Small Step 
is to convince the country that it's our patriotic duty to see the humanity in people with whom we disagree. I think we're all, you know, brainwashed. We don't hate each other. No. And when you actually have the experience of, of, of being in contact with other people, it washes away. Shauna Hartley and Roxanne Hi, Gwynn. I'm a registered Republican. I'm a lifelong Democrat. Both fit the bill. Hello, my name is Shauna. I am 63 years old. And I am Roxanne. I am 71 years old. And after their one small step conversation, prove I say's point. Shauna and I are one small step partners. They didn't spend time on policy differences. They focused instead on their shared love of faith, family, and plant-based diets. So the way our culture sees it, you two probably can't sit at the same table for 30 seconds, much less an hour. Or we could. Or we could. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. And we are. And we shall. To frame the job that one small step has cut out for itself, consider this. In 2016, 47 percent of Republicans considered Democrats immoral, not closed-minded, not dishonest, immoral. And by 2022, that number was 72 percent. For Democrats, 35 percent considered Republicans immoral. By 2022, it was 63 percent. Which is why he's brought one small step to this city of 200,000 on the banks of the Chattahoochee River in western Georgia, a crucial battleground state. We are gearing up for the moment after the election, which is going to be one of the most critical moments in, in history in terms of polarization, to try and build the muscle of seeing each other as human beings so that we can withstand this incredible stress test. Columbus is one of three cities where they're testing the potential of their concept to mitigate a looming crisis. And the idea is that they can show the rest of the country what it means to have the courage to, to listen. It's awesome. <laughs> listen yeah, to each other, despite their differences, just like Shauna and Roxanne. What kind of shape are we in as a culture? Mm. I think we're very wounded right now. We're very angry. However, the wound is where the light gets in. And I'm hoping that this whole process here and many other processes are that light. And we just need to be open to it. For one small step, that would be a massive return. For Eye on America, I'm Jim Axelrod in Columbus, Georgia. And what a friendship they have now. That's it for us at CBS News 24-7. Have a great weekend.